Catherine. Thank you very much, Speaker. It's my uh, pleasure to join debate today. Um, I would first like to start off by thanking my leader, Patrick Brown, and our women's issues critic, Laurie Scott, uh, for allowing me to have carriage for this bill. It's very important to me, and I think I've demonstrated that to the members of this assembly, um, but also uh, to the people that I represent in the City of Ottawa. And for the young woman out there who might be 18 years old, just hit the age of majority, may have been sexually assaulted, and may have had to travel hours to a clinic in order for her to get safe health care while worrying about her privacy, worrying about the impacts of her family if they found out, and then worrying about her own mental health after making a decision that would be life-altering. And so I think it's only appropriate that at the Legislative Assembly here in Ontario, we act uh, at the request of the Mayor of Ottawa, Jim Watson, who used to serve as a member of uh, this Assembly as the uh, Associate Health Minister. He requested that the Government of Ontario act by creating a safe space for women who, like that 18-year-old girl, had to walk to a clinic and who had to be harassed while she did it by, in many cases, men much older than her shouting obscenities to her based on a personal choice that she had made, understanding that this could change her life, it could change her relationships with her family, and it could change her standing in society. So make no mistake. It is my opinion that this has nothing to do with freedom of expression or freedom of speech. I happen to be pro-choice. There are members in the Liberal Party and in the Progressive Conservative Party who are not pro-choice. They are pro-life. I respect their position. I respect their opinion. It's different than mine. But that's not what this bill is about, whether you're pro-choice or you're pro-life. It is about the safety, security, and protection of women, some who could be very young and very vulnerable. I had a colleague the other day talk to me. He has a 27-year-old daughter, and she has to walk by the clinic in Ottawa on Bank Street. And whether she's going in there or not, and she wasn't, she was walking by, and I remember this as a young Hill staffer too, walking by this clinic on Bank Street, getting to work and being harassed and looking at pictures that would make my stomach curl. And he said to me, you know, my daughter really wants this bill to pass because she feels harassed while she's walking down the street. And I can tell you something, having walked by there last Thursday in Ottawa, I had been on TV with, uh, on the CBC, and if you're from Ottawa, you know that most of our roads at the moment right now are being ripped up for light rail and therefore roads are closed, it's hard to find access, it's hard to find parking. I start walking down Bank Street, and I realize at this moment, I can't go any further, Speaker. I can't go any further. I have to ask my assistant to go get the car. Because I realize if I walked by that clinic, I would have been harassed. I would have been harassed because I have been vocal on this issue. I would have been harassed because I am a woman. Not so youngish anymore, Speaker, but I am a woman. And I'm going to tell you how close these protesters were from me to our clerk's table. Now, what is that? About three feet from the door of a clinic when a young woman was trying to get access to something that's perfectly legal, something that's perfectly safe, something that's part of our health care system. Whether you like it or not, that's a reality. Can you imagine a protester? And imagine if you're 18 years old, and, and this protester in particular, he might have been about 68 years old, and angry, and angry. And as somebody who's been very vocal about mental health issues, I could only imagine the anxiety a woman would have feeling physically intimidated by these folks that were protesting. And God love them, they have the right to protest, go to Parliament Hill, Go to the front of this assembly, but don't go to someone's house. Don't go into someone's pharmacy. Don't stand there and intimidate people who are going to work or who are going to seek legal medical services. 
So again, I, I, I totally do not think that this is either a pro-life or pro-choice issue. I don't think it's about freedom of expression or freedom of speech. I think it's about the safety of, quite frankly, every woman in this legislature, whether they're pro-choice or pro-life. I think it's about the safety of the young ladies and women that I represent. And I'm not even going to get into the fact that, that in some cases, women are making choices. They may have been pro-life before they were sexually assaulted or raped. Things change in people's lives, and I don't think we have to, have to uh, question their motivations. I think the job of this assembly, job one, is to make sure that people in the province of Ontario are protected. And in this particular case, it is the women who may be seeking those services. So uh, again, I think it, it's simply from my perspective, and I believe my caucus colleagues' perspective, because we've, we've spoken extensively about it, um, the safety of women. And uh, which, is, which is entirely consistent with how we've approached this bill. Um, it was uh, not last Thursday, but the previous Thursday, where I landed and I had spoken to my leader, Patrick Brown, and, and his office staff, and I, I said, this happens to be an issue. It's very important to me. Uh, I, I really feel very personal, uh, personally that this has to be addressed, um, and can I, can I take carriage of this bill, and can we seek to make it happen? The government said that they had widely consulted. They effectively had said that it was a, a perfect bill, and I, I was really worried that what was going to happen is it would, this would become a deeply politicized issue where we would continue to polarize the public of, of two opposing spectrums. And I'm, and I'm going to, because one of the people that I've talked to quite a bit, and she's in the House right now, is, is our member from Thornhill, Gila Marteau. And we're both pro-choice. But we recognize that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, pro-abortion. It doesn't necessarily, obviously, we support life. We're mothers. But the debate today on almost everything is so volatile. And it's so one side here and one side there. They can't be in the middle. And so I was afraid, Speaker, what was going to happen is we were just going to try and pick off members and we were going to try and inflame the left and inflame the right, and, and at what cost? For the vulnerable woman who we should just be protecting, which is why I said, let's get on with this. Let's get on with this. I'm happy to see that the government's come to the table at this point in time and we are going to pass it, and I, I, I would hope that we don't have significant a number, a number of amendments. Uh, we think the bill is as is, is perfect as is, so we're, going to, we're not going to be submitting any, any amendments. Uh, I hope that we have some stakeholders come in, but I believe this has been widely, uh, widely done in the past. And of course, we have had in numerous times in this House, Speaker, you and I have been here uh, quite a bit for many years, and, and we've, we've seen in the past where we have come together on an issue of importance to the people of Ontario, and we've, we, we've fast-tracked a bill, and I believe in the time I've been here, it's been about 12 times. And I think, and I think this is one of those areas. And, and again, I would, I would hate to see us become political or polarizing, because we have a, a moment right here in this legislature to talk about some very pressing issues that are going, around, going uh, on, not only here, but worldwide. And I'm going to tell you, Speaker, right now there is a social media campaign called Me Too. And I think it's a, a campaign that really resonates with me. It's one that I think uh, has taken uh, the world by storm. And it started because of an abusive, very powerful man who used his power and his influence to sexually har harass and sexually assault female actresses, and that's Harvey Weinstein. And we know he's not alone. We had our own cases here with Jean Gomeshi. And what happens when women, and, then th and this, is, this, uh, this is part of a, a, broader, a broader umbrella here, Speaker. It's about me being a woman, our young staff being fe young females, our young pages who are women. It's, it, it's all about how we are treated in society. And someone's going to call me a raging lefty, but I'm not going to take that. I'm going to, I, I know no, not many people in this House would ever question my conservatism. But I'm going to tell you something. I know that there are women who have been sexually assaulted and sexually harassed and have had to seek these services. I also know that over our past and our history, whether it's in this province or if it's in California or if it's halfway around the world, 
Women have been dealing with this forever. So the Me Too campaign is actually talking about any woman who has been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. And I'm going to venture that probably most women in this assembly could go on their Twitter or on their Facebook or on any other social media today and say, hashtag me too. And I'm going to do it after this speech when I, when I put my remarks up. Because, Speaker, that's what we've, we've dealt with. And I think so if we're going to have a conversation and we're not just going to play lip service to women's rights, women's, women's protection, um, and, and righting some historic wrongs, you know that's that that's the reality. I I I think that we have a moment here, a moment to take a stand. And as female legislators and as male legislators, I have my colleague Randy Pettipiece here, uh, who has been a great supporter of me. And 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 we have an opportunity in this moment to make change. And whether that's keeping women safe from harassment, or whether at at a, at a clinic, or whether that's keeping women safe when they go out at night. Uh, that's a role we have to play. That's our duty, in fact. You think about it, 100 years ago, in this assembly, there wasn't one woman. And now here we are today with about 30% of the, of the House. So let's collectively think about how we, can, how we can change and how we can move forward. And I take women's rights very seriously, Speaker, as a woman, as a mother. Uh, as, a, as a hockey coach to a young female team. I want my girls, and my daughter in particular, as, but every girl, to have the same rights as every little boy without any systemic barriers. So we have to continue to work and, and do that, and that's what we are here to do today. And I remember, in particular, when I tweeted out um, my outrage at John Gomeshi, and I'll never, ever forget it. I had two people contact me immediately. One was a friend who said, Lisa, Gomeshi's hands off because he's so powerful and popular, you're, it's going to be a backlash to you. And then another was the former Liberal candidate who ran in 2003, and he said, don't you know anything about Canadian culture? He's an icon. That came from a, a fee, a, a, two males, one a Conservative, one a Liberal. And I said, you don't get it. You don't get it. You've never walked a mile in my shoes or any other woman's shoes in this country. If he's done it, which I suspect he has, well, then we'll say it. And then you see what happens. You see what the legal process does. You see what happens to women who stand up and speak out, which is why when a woman seeks this type of service, her privacy is more important than any other time probably in her life. She's making a decision based on her body. Whether you like it or not, it's her body. It's our body. And a man uh, may be part of that process, but I don't think he fully understands it if he's out there protesting a teenager. <laughs> Maybe a mother who, uh, whose family just uh, broke up. I, I, I don't know, and I don't profess to know, and I'm not going to judge. It's not for me. And I know if a woman comes forward with sexual assault or sexual harassment, I'm not going to judge her either. And uh, I know that there are certain processes in place, and, and we let those processes go in place. But, Speaker, to come out and say that you've been sexually assaulted or sexually harassed is very hard uh, for a woman seeking um, abortion services. Uh, <laughs> they're, not, they're not doing it because they want to. There are circumstances, <laughs> and, and I, I, have to, I have to put that out there. But, but I want to go back to this idea and this notion where we can polarize or play wedge politics and where we can try and divide people and conquer people because it might be electorally successful. That is shameful, and it is wrong. And I want to, and I want to go to this because what ends up happening is you're not putting women first. You're, full, f uh, you're further subjecting us to old stereotypes and to some systemic barriers. We're basically used as pawns in a political game. And this dates back, Speaker, to 25 years ago, 
when Jean Chrétien was using this as a wedge issue against the federal Conservative Party. It's dated back 25 years. We are better than that. We have evolved, Speaker. And just because I happen to sit on this side of the House doesn't mean I am any less committed to the safety and protection of the women in the province of Ontario. I can tell you that, and it also says the same thing about my colleagues who will unanimously support this bill. That brings me to something that else that happened last week that completely made my blood curl. This organization called the Working Ontario Women, run by a man, a former staffer for the Liberal Party, that's going to run millions of dollars, probably, of attack ads on my leader, Patrick Brown, and they want to talk about abortion. So I called them out, Speaker. As you know, I am. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, a wallflower. wallflower. I'm not shy, I guess is the word. And I called them out for who they are. They're a liberal front group intended to stoke up these issues, social conservative issues, to try and hurt my party, to play the old red book of Jean Chrétien. I'm not going to stand for it. I'm not going to stand for it. My colleagues, we're not going to stand for it. Enough is enough is enough is enough. We actually want to put women's rights first. We want to put women's protection first. Then you know what? Stop stooping to those tactics, because that's when people are going to question your motive. And that's why I'm questioning their motive, Speaker. I know where I stand. Standing firmly behind this desk, I've been elected to for the past 12 years, four elections, and I have a microphone, I'm going to use it. And my podium is to stand here and tell the others that we have a duty. We don't have a duty because my friend Monique over there is a new Democrat, so I have to, my duty is to oppose everything she does. That's absolutely not the case. We work together on different things. The government has a bill. I'm happy to support it. But that doesn't seem to be good enough for them. You know, I've been asked throughout this process if this will hurt me as a Conservative in my riding. It might. It might. I could lose my seat in the next election because I stood up for an 18-year-old girl to be safe walking down Bank Street in Ottawa. And if the people of my constituency think that ill of me for supporting that young girl at 18 years old, then I'll lose my seat. It's plain and simple. I don't think I will, Speaker, because I think people know when I stand up I'm a fighter. But Anita Murray, Anita Murray, she deserves a shout out. You want to know who Anita Murray is? Anita Murray lives in Ottawa, and she called my office today to tell me I'm nothing but a hidden liberal and she's going to run a conservative candidate against me. Think about that, Speaker. Anita Murray probably doesn't know where she stands on fiscal conservatism. She probably doesn't know where she stands on law and order. Hell, if she actually stood up for law and order and had conservative views, she'd be standing right here with me, applauding me for standing up for the safety of young women. But no, Anita Murray, she's got other plans. And so I'll welcome her candidate in the next election. And I'm going to tell you something, Speaker. I intend on coming back here in 2018 with a stronger mandate from the people of Nepean. So I think, I, and I think that's important because here we are stereotyping who people are on, on morality issues and on issues of conscience. Stereotyping, conservatives obviously all have to think that way. Liberals all have to think that way. On personal issues, that's not true, Speaker. That's not true. We have pillars of conservatism, accountability, fiscal conservatism. Uh, we have the, the law and order conservatism. We believe in safe street, strong families, and self-reliance. Literally, in a nutshell, that is how we could describe who we are. We believe in strong families, but that doesn't mean we eliminate choice. And so that's why I am here today. But this is further perpetuated by people, and I'm going to call out the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, who a few weeks ago essentially said that, that women uh, that gender equality, sorry, is uh, at, at uh, risk because of conservatives. Oh, really? 
I wrote an op-ed in the Ottawa Sun about this because after he said that, his office decided that they were going to ban Rachel Harder, an MP, a young, brilliant young woman, from being the chair of the Status of uh, Women Committee because she happened to be pro-life. And I said in the article, as a woman who chairs numerous meetings, who cares? Do you think when I'm sitting in public accounts and I have to chair the meeting that I think about my personal issues? No, I think about the rules and procedures and making sure that we continually and properly debate the issues or that we welcome our deputants. I couldn't think of anything more egregious than playing that card, that pro-choice, pro-life card. Because if you really believe in the safety of women and the protection of women, then you don't play the game Prime Minister Trudeau played. And if he wants, and I'll take him through a history lesson, and let me take everybody here through one. What has the Conservative Party done for women in politics? Let's start with Sir Robert Borden. Now, I'm partial to him, Speaker, because not only was he a Conservative Prime Minister, he was also from Nova Scotia, just as I grew up in Nova Scotia. Sir Robert Borden was the first Prime Minister to give or legislate a woman's right to vote. Then came uh, John George Diefenbaker. He became the first Canadian Prime Minister to appoint a woman as Deputy Prime Minister and Secretary of State. After Diefenbaker left, the first woman to run for a party leadership uh, was a Conservative. Later on, the much-loved, well-known, late Flora Macdonald became the first serious leadership contender of a major political party. She also forced Justin Trudeau's father to include gender, gender equality into the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It was Pat Kearney who was the first to tell the House of Commons that they needed to ensure that family members, not just spouses, could travel from the constituency, in her case, British Columbia, to Ottawa. Sometimes we take for granted, I certainly do sometimes, the ability for me to take my daughter to Queen's Park and understand that that's a, 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 a legitimate expense, which takes me to my daughter who was just a baby when I arrived here. And I fought that fight to make Ontario the first family-friendly legislature in the country. And now Equal Voice is using my background, and they're using some of my work to make all legislatures livable. Locally, my mentors include Senator Marjorie LeBreton, who is the government leader in the Senate, the most powerful woman in Stephen Harper's government. She's now since retired. City Councillor Jan Harder, who is just like a mother to me. She uh, um, celebrated 20 years in elective office last year, doing it while raising five daughters. Now she spends most of her time with her grandkids. Strong, tough, conservative woman. And the late Jean Piggott and her two sisters, Greet Hale, and Gay Cook, who, by the way, are going to be hosting a fundraiser for me, even though I can't attend, thanks to the Liberal government's rules, which I also think are uh, harder for women because it's harder for us, especially hockey moms like me, to go out and ask my friends for 1200 bucks. but your cabinet minister and your mail over there, that's, no, that's another point. But Maureen McTeer will be at that. And what we're also going to do is we're going to be bringing in young women to talk about what it means to be a progressive conservative. And we're doing that because one of the projects I had the opportunity to work with with Equal Voice it was actually inspired by my daughter. It was called Daughters of the Vote, where we brought 338 young women to Parliament Hill so that they could take their seat on the floor of the House of Commons. And it was incredible. But thanks to the rhetoric, like Jean Chrétien and the way they've handled this bill, and also Trudeau, there were a number of young girls who are like-minded with me, pro-choice, liberated, they feel that they had to start a website called Story of a Tory because they feel that this perpetual state of liberal attacks on conservatives on social issues has gone too far. And so I wanted to make sure that I recommended 
anybody that's interested in conservatism and they're a young woman is to follow this story of a Tory.ca. These kids are incredible. I, uh, I want to say thanks to a couple of my colleagues in the past term. And there's been numbers, like I could talk about Elizabeth Whitmer, for example, Speaker, who became the, the province's first Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Premier, or Margaret Birch, uh, or Janet Ecker, uh, trailblazers, first in each of their own categories. We have a record here. I should have talked a little bit more about our provincial um, legacy. And I should do a little bit more research in that because I, I should actually talk about some of the wonderful things that we have accomplished that we only far too often let the other side tell. And sometimes it's not actually uh, maybe, well, I can't say that because that would be unparliamentary. <laughs> so I'll move on from that. But, but my colleagues, uh, and two of them are from Eastern Ontario, have done remarkable work in this assembly. Because it's also topical back home in Eastern Ontario, I want to talk about John Yakubuski, whose work after Will Know uh, and, and the murders in his community uh, really affected him. And he, you know, he brought his community's concerns here for the greater protection of women in rural Ontario. The next person I want to talk about is Randy Hillier who was very open about the abuse his own daughter endured and the lack of services in rural Ontario to support women who are struggling, whether that's against violence or sexual harassment or sexual assault. Um, they, were, they were very, very committed to their constituents. And the, the final person, I, and I want to thank all my members, obviously, but I just wanted to point a few out. The next one, and I think she's doing incredible work. Her name is Lori Scott. And her human trafficking work, her anti-human trafficking work, is exquisite. She's taken me to roundtables, she's taken our leader and others to roundtables to, to meet women who have been trafficked. And if you don't think that's happening in our community, think again. And talk about women who may need these services, women who have been trafficked. And they, and they might be trafficked, and I, I'll, I'll uh, just depart a little bit from my script, which I don't really have a script anyway, Speaker, if you know me, but I'll depart for a second from my script. A few weeks ago, I, I know I've been working a great deal on the opioid crisis in Ottawa. One of the fathers uh, whose ki child has been struggling uh, just recently told me over the summer that she had relapsed, as she's since been clean, and she was trying to buy some of these counterfeit Percocets, and she's uh, under 18 and ended up trapped in this home, this drug home, and they were trying to traffic his daughter. And you want to know how he found her? Her Facebook account was open, and she, he could see her texting her friends or messaging her friends, asking for help because she was going to be sold. So when I think of the work my colleague, Lori Scott, is doing on behalf of vulnerable women in Ontario, I'm extremely proud of her, and I think that uh, we all owe her a debt of gratitude for raising this issue. She had a bill called the, girl, the, 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 Saving, the girl. Saving the Girl Next Door Act, and uh, when I think of the story that I recently heard, you know, I think, I think about the work she's doing and thinking about how hard it must be for Lori to listen to some of those stories and not have nightmares at night. So I, I wanted to, to say thank you uh, to all of them. So let's remove the cynicism I may have uh, for why certain issues are brought up, um, and, and let's just remove the polarization, remove the politicization, and all agree that we need to do more in society, and particularly through this legislative channel, to encourage the safety and protection of women, whether that is them seeking health care services, whether that's how they report abuse or harassment in the workplace, whether that's making sure people know that uh, just because a skirt might be short, it doesn't necessarily invite uh, touching. And let's make sure that every little girl in the province of Ontario has the same rights and protections as every little boy in the province of Ontario. And so with that speaker, 
Uh, again, I want to thank my colleague, Lori Scott, and my leader, Patrick Brown, for entrusting me with this piece of legislation. Um, Lori is our critic for this, and I, I do appreciate it. And if I could leave one parting comment uh, to my colleagues is on these issues. There might be a better way than trying to play political games uh, because the safety and protection of women is far too important. So thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to supporting this as our Progressive Conservative Caucus will as well.